Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good to see you all, many of you uh, again. Uh, we're very lucky tonight to have uh, our speaker, Shiraz Minwala. Uh, you can read his bio in the pamphlets that were handed out, but uh, he went to college at one of the famous Indian Institute of Technologies, the IIT Kanpur. These, these are the institutes that produced very, very many uh, engineers and physicists that are all over the world now. And from there he went to Princeton for graduate school, uh, where he worked with Natty Seiberg, um, very well known particle physicist, string theorist, mathematician. <laughs> uh, and from graduate school to, he was a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, and then a faculty position at Harvard. And from there he went to his present position, which is another great place, the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research, TIFR, in Mumbai. Fantastic place to visit for the science and for the city and the region. Um, as Lars mentioned, uh, Shiraz is doing triple duty here. He's part of the current program that we're running, one of the two programs that we're currently running. Uh, he's part of the program called Bootstrapping Quantum Gravity. And it'll be related to, I'm sure, to what he's talking about tonight, but you can ask him more about uh, bootstrapping. And then he's giving this public lecture. And then tomorrow and Friday, half day Friday, he's, he's on our advisory board where we all get together to evaluate proposals for the 2024-25 program year. So going through summer 2025. So we're working two and a half years uh, in advance. Um, so that's, uh, we're really making them work. <laughs> that's, uh, but uh, that's what we're able to do with uh, these wonderful people visiting from all over the world. Uh, Shiraz has won many prizes. You've got the list there. I'll just mention the, the International Center for Theoretical Physics prize. Uh, 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 which is an institute in Trieste in Italy, and uh, the New Horizons Breakthrough Prize. And therefore work that's very much related to what he's going to describe today, quantum gravity, and in particular making unexpected connections between things like hydrodynamics, fluid equations of motion, and Einstein's equations describing gravity. So with that, uh, I turn the floor over to Shiraz and, and thank you for being with us to give this lecture. And thank you so much. That was a very kind introduction. It's wonderful to be here in every capacity. Okay. Um, my talk today is titled The Search for Quantum Gravity. And uh, um, it will have a few parts. I will first try to explain what, what I mean by the search for, for quantum gravity. I will try to explain the question that is being addressed to you. Um, then I will say maybe two, three, a, a few lines about this thing called the, the string framework within which my talk will be set. Um, and then a large part of the talk would be this, describing one satisfactory, one satisfactory mathematical model for quantum gravity that has come out of work in string theory over the last 20, 25 years. Um, uh, this, this is, you know, use, uses the so-called ADS-CFT correspondence. I will then talk about some implications of what we've learned here, including uh, what I call applied gravity, gravity put to the service of other areas of physics. Uh, then I, I will have some future outlooks and conclusions. Okay, so let's start. As most of you know, um, over the last few hundred years, theoretical physicists have, have developed an increasingly sophisticated you know, set of mathematical models that uh, taken together describe an astoundingly large variety of natural phenomena. One of the things I find totally remarkable about this is that the different models of theoretical physics are all underlain by 
a few basic frameworks that uh, uh, have universal applicability. Okay, so a few basic frameworks, and by frame, framework I mean a sort of mathematical structure, an interpretative structure that goes with the with the mathematics. Um, a few basic frameworks underlie more or less all of the models of, of, of physics. The two frameworks that will play a key role in my talk are first the quantum framework, the framework of quantum mechanics. This framework was developed between let's say 1900 and 1930 or so and in particular is the framework that sets the sort of basic grammar uh, that, was that is used to, de to develop in particular theories of particle physics, theories of uh, the physics of the very small objects that make up the world we live in. Okay, let me say a little bit more about that. Uh, in modern theories of elementary particle physics are set within a sort of specialized version of the quantum framework, um, within the framework of what are called quantum field theories. Now I'm going to give you a minute about what quantum field theories are like. We'll see a little bit more about these theories as we go on in the talk. Okay, quantum field theories are set in a space-time that is unchanging. Okay, so space and time are sort of grid, a stage on which dynamics happens. They're there once and for all, nothing happens to them. Okay, they form the background for the dynamics of quantum field theories. Okay, now within the quantum field theory, I mean, when we're studying quantum field theory, each point in space hosts one or a finite number of quantum degrees of freedom. These quantum degrees of freedom interact with each other, and this this interaction uh, gives rise to the dynamics um, that you know underlies uh, the physics described by these theories. It's sort of important that these degrees of freedom live one per point in space-time. Everything is local. In degrees of freedom here, uh, encode what's happening here. Degrees of freedom there encode what's happening there. Interactions between here and there, uh, more or less, always happen because things move from here to there. There are no direct interactions between here and there. Okay? So, quantum field theories, uh, just to summarize, are a framework in which space and time is non-dynamical. It's a stage, it's a background. You have degrees of freedom, one, one or a finite number per, per point in space. These degrees of freedom are quantum in nature, whatever that means. And they interact with each other locally. Okay, the, tied, the degrees of freedom are tied to the structure of space-time. Okay, the second framework that will play a, play a big role in my talk is the framework of the general theory of relativity. The general theory of relativity, of course, which was developed by Einstein, is the framework that is used for, to develop modern theories of, for instance, cosmology. Now, within this framework, space and time is a dynamical manifold. Okay, So space and time ex exist like it did for the quantum theory, so it forms the background as it did for the quantum theory, but in this case, Space and time is not a passive background. It's not a stage in which dynamics happen. It's a participant in sort of the drama of the universe. As things move around in space-time, they affect the geometry of space-time. And the geometry of space-time affects how things move around in space-time. Okay? So that's one big difference between the framework of general relativity and that of quantum field theory. Space-time, which was inert, passive in the first framework, is dynamical a participant in the dynamics of, of, the, of the world in the second framework. And it's this participation of space-time in the dynamics of the world that gives rise to the force of gravity. So that's one big difference, the dynamical nature of the space of space and time. Okay, now within the framework of general relativity, we once again have degrees of freedom associated with each point in space and therefore and also in time. But the, the framework of general relativity is different in this way. The degrees of freedom that live at points in space and then also in time are classical rather than quantum degrees of freedom. Okay? So you see that the framework of quantum field theory has one aspect, is richer in one aspect than the framework of, of, of general relativity. The aspect in which it's richer is that the degrees of freedom that live at points in space in quantum field theories are quantum degrees of freedom. 
That's a richer framework than classical stuff. On the other hand, the framework of general relativity is richer in another sense. It accounts for the experimentally true fact that space-time is not a, a passive stage, its, its geometry fluctuates. It's a participant in the dynamics of the universe. Okay, great. Now, quantum field theory has been spectacularly successful in, in describing subatomic scale physics. Okay, using quantum field theory, we've, people have been able to compute things, some quantities to eight decimal places, measure the same quantities experimentally to eight decimal places, get, get perfect agreement. It's a fantastic success. Particle physics is very well described with the framework of quantum field theory. On the other hand, the general theory of relativity has been spectacularly successful in describing astrophysical and cosmological dynamics from scales ranging to the size of the universe, from the size of the universe to kilometers and even, even smaller. Okay. However, as I've tried to emphasize to you, things are not as good, you know, are not all hunky-dory. Quantum field theories ignore one aspect of the world that we know to be true. Namely, that space-time is dynamical. General relativity ignores another aspect of the world that we know to be true. Namely, reality is quantum. Okay? So, neither framework, each spectacularly successful in its own domain, is suitable for addressing questions that, in which space-time is both dynamical and quantum. Okay. Now, for some people, this is already enough to <clears throat> try to do more. If there's some situation you can imagine where our frameworks are not good enough, we should, we're not satisfied. We want to do more. But the, the more pragmatic of you might be wondering, okay, before you convince me you want to go beyond these wonderfully successful uh, frameworks, quantum field theory and general relativity, give me an example of a phenomenon that you want to describe that requires or plausibly requires uh, you to be able to describe quantum dynamical space times. And there's a great example of such a phenomenon. Um, it's likely the birth of the universe. So let me give you two minutes uh, on that statement. As you know, the general relativistic theory of cosmology has been used to model the evolution of the universe and has done this very well. Now, the laws of physics can be used to take an initial condition, to take what we see and predict the future. But the laws of physics are sort of agnostic about whether we run time forwards or backwards. So, if we want to become historians for a minute, we can do that using the equations of physics. We can look at the universe as we see it now and use the equations of physics to run, to run the clock, to run the movie backwards, to try to reconstruct what happened in the past in the universe. So, that's what we can do. What we do is we look at what the galaxies are doing now, okay, and then plug all that information into Einstein's equations, the equations that describe cosmology. And instead of trying to predict the future from, from that point, we try to post it, we try to reconstruct the past. We run the movie backwards. So the movie, when it ran forwards, has, as all of you know, galaxies that are, accelerate, that are moving away from each other at the moment even in an accelerating way. If we run that movie backwards, we see these galaxies coming towards each other. They come towards each other, they go, 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 go. And then we reach a point when we run this movie backwards, where, the, where everything in the known universe, everything in the universe we can see now, is compressed to something extremely, extremely small. Okay? Feels like we're reaching something really interesting. What happened before that? Answer, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Because we only know what we know, because we can take what we see now and run the movie backwards using the equations of physics. When we get to the pla this place where things are so interesting, we really want to know what happened before that. We don't know because the equations of physics that we have now presumably fail. We don't know the right equations to run the movie back before that point. And this is one good, one good reason, I feel. Okay, it's not totally clear, but it's certainly plausible that the equations that of physics that we'll need to run the movie backwards beyond this point are the equations of quantum gravity. It's not totally clear, but it's plausible that that's the case. So this is one reason to try to try to to want to try to know the equations of quantum gravity. If you want to know what happened, how what happened before that scrunchy thing 
How did the universe begin? Oh, was there even a beginning? Plausibly, in order to address that question, we need the equations of quantum gravity. Okay. Great. Um, all right, I was on the wrong slide, but okay. Ah, uh, fine. Great. So now all of you are convinced we need to know the equations of quantum gravity. We don't have them. Okay. Why don't we just find them? Okay. There's a problem. The problem is this. The search for, for the quantum theory of gravity is greatly hampered by an unfortunate circumstance. Quantum fluctuations of space-time space geometry are important, are practically speaking important, only at very small length scales. The scale has a name, it's called the Planck scale. Now, one way we get to shorter and shorter scales in physics is taking objects and banging them together faster and faster. Okay? And we've done pretty well. There's this big accelerator in Geneva, um, which, which uh, bangs particles together really fast. It's called the LHC. And it probes down to distances roughly of order 10 to the power minus 18 meters. 10 to the power minus 18, which means uh, a billionth of a billionth of a meter. That's pretty good. It's very small. Okay. However, at least my estimates suggest that the quantum fluctuations of space-time, the, the place where the fact that space and time is both dynamical as well as quantum, where our current frameworks don't do a good job in explaining things, occurs at length scales that are much smaller still, 10 to the power minus 34 meters. So a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth and then a hundred times that uh, uh, meters. So we've gone sort of halfway there, but we've got another halfway to go. And it's very difficult, you know. Every time you make an accelerator bigger, you maybe get a factor of 10 or 100. But it's very difficult. We've got a long way to go. So the fact that these fluctuations are important at such small length scales is a damper. It makes it hard for us uh, to do experiments to study the nature of these fluctuations. Okay. Well, some of you are thinking, well, be more creative. It's a little childish to bang things together very fast, do something more, 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 you know, more interesting. Well, let's see. As I've mentioned, it's very plausible that quantum fluctuations in, in the early universe played a big role in the physics there. So, you might think, well, if we're really smart, we can take what we see now, run the movie backwards using the equations of physics and deduce what was happening at that very early time. And from there, get data about the nature of quantum fluctuations in the very early universe. But okay, once, actually, you know, a little bit of this can be done. It's quite amazing. It's because of this thing called the theory of inflation, which allows some fluctuations to stay uncontaminated by what happens in the middle, for an amazing reason. But that's very little. If you think about, if you think about the words that I said, it immediately sounds unreasonable. You know, so much has happened in the last 14 billion years. Um, We've got uh, protons, uh, you know, protons and electrons, which were separated, came together to form atoms. Then there was there were stars formed, supernovas happened, galaxies formed. All kinds of crazy stuff has happened. If we want to try to filter all that away and see from what we see now, what were the details of the quantum fluctuations in the early universe? Maybe one day we'll be able to do it. But clearly, it's a very hard thing to do. Okay, so this is hard in another way. Fine, let's try to find some. So we've looked at, we've looked at trying to bang things together very hard. We're not, not within our capabilities now. We looked at trying to deduce from what, what, what we know may have been happening in the early universe. That looks, looks very tough. What about other, other places in the universe which are effectively particle accelerators? Something that the universe has done, na natural phenomena, nature has done to make things go very quantum. Well, there are such places. Um, for instance, likely the center of black holes are places where uh, quantum fluctuations of uh, gravity are very important. But unfortunately, there's another problem here. This pro the problem is that these, center, these, these black holes, the centers of black holes are shielded from the outside by an event horizon, a one-way surface from which nothing, no information, not even information that you, if you try to send with light can escape. So this means that if you're a very cruel advisor and you send your graduate student into the black hole saying, do this experiment and tell me what's happening, 
That student, if she's very obedient, might do the experiment, but she'd never be able to publish her results. <laughs> okay. So, you see, every place which has experimental data for quantum gravity somehow seems out of reach for us at the moment. So we are constrained to embark on our quest for the quantum theory of gravity with very limited guidance from experiment. Okay, so what do we do in such a situation? Well, there are many things you could do, but a group of physicists, the group that call themselves string theorists, have decided, roughly speaking, on a particular strategy. It's a strategy that, that are named after a famous joke. I like to call the strategy of the spherical cow. So this, uh, this joke goes as follows, I'm sure some of you have heard it, but, but uh, let me repeat it anyway. The joke goes as follows, there's um, a farmer who has a prize cow, uh, who used to give, you know, great milk, and she stopped, it's, it stopped. And the farmer's very upset, but he has a, a Nobel Prize winning physicist friend. So he thinks, this guy's so smart, I'll go and ask him to help me fix the problem. So the friend comes over and looks at the cow and says, hmm, let me mo model the cow as a perfect sphere. And at which point the farmer says, thank you for your efforts, and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, carries on. Okay, uh, the point of this joke is the following. When physicists are faced with a problem that is too difficult to solve in all detail, what physicists often do is to retreat to looking for a toy model that captures some of the essence of the problem, but not all of the complications. You try to solve that toy model and see if you can make progress. Maybe that helps you go towards what you want to, really want to do. So, what, what, what people have been doing to try to understand this theory of quantum gravity is to try to look for spherical cow theories of quantum gravity. What do I mean by that? It has proved surprisingly difficult to construct even one non-trivial mathematically consistent model of quantum fluctuation, fluctuating space times. Okay, people have tried over, you know, 60, 70 years. Okay, uh, maybe even more. And it's, it's proved very difficult to find such a, even one example. You see, I want to emphasize that I've lowered my standard. When, when, when you try to describe, let's say, quantum electrodynamics a theory will, whose description we'll come back to in a minute, you want to describe the theory that's describing the physics of the real world, the physics of atoms and uh, radiation and so on. Here, I'm lowering my standard. I'm not asking for the quantum theory of gravity that describes the world we live in. I'm asking for any consistent mathematical theory that has quantum mechanics and gravity, you know, has all the features, the gross features that we see in the world we live in. Okay? And even that has been, has been very hard to find. Okay? However, in 1997, a young Argentinian theorist named Maldusena was able to construct well, in my opinion, is the first fully satisfactory model of this sort. Okay? This is the spherical cow model of quantum gravity that I'm going to try to describe to you in the next 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so, what I'm going to try to do over the next 10 minutes is to describe the complete formulation presented by Maldasena of one consistent quantum theory of gravity. One consistent theory that has dynamical geometries fluctuating in a quantum manner. Okay? But before I do that, in order to ex emphasize, in order for you to, to help you understand how novel and surprising the answer is, I'm going to first review for you a sort of similar sounding question that was addressed um, between 1928 and 1950. The question that physicists were then faced with, the, the frontier question for, for this kind of physics at that time was to find the quantum theory of electrons interacting with the electromagnetic field, okay? After a lot of grappling and a lot of difficult technical stuff that had to be accomplished and was remarkably accomplished by many famous physicists, okay? Um, the, at the end of this period, we came to a solution. The solution was a theory called quantum electrodynamics, okay? And as I said, the, you know, for graduate stu students learning about quantum electrodynamics, it feels very complicated and very hard. But if you stand back and look at it from above, it looks very, conceptually, what was done was very simple. You see, in classical electrodynamics, Maxwell's theory that many of you have studied in, in college, we have fields, electric and magnetic fields, 
one for each, one, one, one vector, electric vector and a magnetic vector at each point in space. These are some classical degrees of freedom at each point in space. In the end, what quantum electrodynamics was, was to take, was a theory in which corresponding to each classical degree of freedom, there's a quantum degree of freedom. There's a quantum electric vector, roughly speaking. Okay, and a quantum magnetic vector at each point in space. Okay, and these quantum things are constructed so that in an appropriate weak coupling limit, they reduce to their classical counterparts. Okay, so the quantum theory of electrons interacting with light was a remarkable technical accomplishment, but in some sense, almost disappointingly uh, without surprise. For every classical degree of freedom, there was a quantum degree of freedom. The procedure for quantizing electromagnetism, or interacting with electrons, was very similar to the procedure we used for quantizing particles. Okay, fine. That's how that went. Now, I want you to, uh, want to contrast, uh, contrast that with what we're going to see now. We want to try to understand one spherical Carl theory of gravity. I want to emphasize again, this is not the theory we live in. Okay, we're not claiming or not attempting to find the quantum theory of the gravity that we, in the, in the universe we inhabit. It's just a toy model. Okay, what is the gravity theory we're after? We're after a theory of fluctuating space times in some 10 dimensional space. Now, what does this mean? Um, well, our universe, the one, the one that we can see, has three dimensions in space. There's that way, that way, and that way. But there's also time. Einstein taught us that we shouldn't separate space from time. So our universe has four dimensions in space and time. The, the universe the, that we are trying to mathematically describe has nine spatial directions. There are nine ways and different ways in which you can move. Hard to imagine. Impossible, at least for me. Okay, but you can imagine it mathematically. And there is time. Okay? We do not live in such a universe, at least where all nine dimensions are big. We don't live in such a universe. But that's not what we're trying. We're trying to do the spherical cow business. Okay. Now, this space, apart from being ten dimensional, the space and time has one other property that's different from the world we live in. In the world we live in, space and time are sort of flat. You can imagine spaces that are not flat. For instance, the two-dimensional manifold that is the surface of a sphere is not flat. And geometry on that manifold is very different. Okay? This ten-dimensional manifold is not flat. Five of the ten dimensions are a five-dimensional sphere. This is not too hard to get your mind around. A two-dimensional sphere is a set of all points in three dimensions that is unit distance from the unit distance distance from the origin. In the same way, a five-dimensional sphere is a set of all points in a six-dimensional space that is unit distance from the origin. It's not too hard to imagine mathematically. Okay? That gets rid of the five of these dimensions. There are another five, four of which are space and one is time, and that, that those other five are curved in a sort of uh, a way that involves time. There's curvature of space into time, and so I'm not going to try to describe it here. Some space. Okay, it's called ADS5. It has a name. Okay. So, this is the solution of the theory when nothing's happening in it. But of course, in gravity, part of the fun of gravity is that space time changes. So, when I say we're trying to find the theory of gravity in this space, what I mean is we're trying to find a theory of gravity which, when nothing's happening, looks like the space. And then, when something's happening, is something inside, and then looks like the space far away. Uh, physicists like to say asymptotically is ADS5 times S5. Okay, we want to find the quantum theory, quantum theory of gravity of this, this space. Technically, it's an, anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, now, if you were primed up by my, my example of quantum electrodynamics, you would have said, well, that's easy. This space, uh, we know the classical theory, it's Einstein theory. It has one classical degree of freedom for every metric component. Okay, all I do is take these metric components and promote them to quantum operators. And you know, there'll be some bells and whistles and some infinities and some technicalities, but in the end, that's what, that's what will make the quantum theory. And this is what people of various sorts tried for many years, never worked. 
Maldesena found another answer to this quantization. His answer was that the quantization of gravity in the space-time was not given by some ten-dimensional theory with, with operators for metric components. It was instead given by a four-dimensional quantum field theory. This four-dimensional quantum field theory has a complicated name. It's called UN N equals 4 D equals 4 super Yang Mills theory. So much of the rest of the talk I will call it supersymmetric Yang Mills. Some four-dimensional quantum field theory. Now, those of you who've been who've been following me think I've lost it at this point. Because I spent the first part of the talk telling you how different quantum field theories were from theories of gravity. And now I'm telling you that the answer to the quantization of a theory of gravity is a quantum field theory. Sort of seems self-contradictory. How does that work? There's a second thing that seems to make no sense. The second thing is that my, four, my quantum field theory lives in four dimensions. Whereas my gravity theory lives in ten dimensions. What, what's the deal? How can it be that the answer to the quantization of a ten dimensional theory is a four dimensional theory? What sense does that make? These two questions are sort of related. First, let me tell you a little bit, just a very little bit about how this works. Okay. You see, this n equals 4, d equals 4, super Yang Mills theory, the theory with a mouthful of a name, supersymmetric Yang Mills, it's complicated field theory. I'm not going to try to explain much about it to you. There's one thing I'm going to tell you about it. That the basic fields in these theories are matrices. They're n cross n matrices. For those of you who know what matrices are. Now, this is important for the following reason. Physicists who were studying quantum theories involving matrices had understood for a long time that something special happens to these theories when the size of the matrices, physicists like to say the rank, the size of the matrices becomes very, very large. Okay? The size of this matrix is denoted by this, 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 this integer n here. So when that n becomes very large, theories in, with matrix degrees of freedom, uh, something special happens to them. And the, something special that happens to them is the following. You might think, that if I make n larger and larger, I'm moving to a more and more complicated theory. Because my quantum field theory has more and more degrees of freedom. And there's a sense in which that's true. But it often happens in physics that when, if you have one degree of freedom, it's simple. If you have five degrees of freedom, it's complicated. But you have a million degrees of freedom, there's a new emergent simplicity. And this is the basis of statistical mechanics. And this thing happens in large n theories. Okay? When n becomes very, very large, physicists have known for a long time that in this large n limit, theories with matrices often become classical. There are the variables that you're allowed to measure in these, 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 these theories, traces of gauge invariant operators, stop fluctuating as much as they would have if n was two or three or four or five. Okay? This is sort of related to this thing in statistics called the law of large numbers. But okay, let's forget about it. We know that this, it's been known for a long time that theories, quantum theories involving matrices develop a new classical limit where things, you know, quantum mechanics is characterized by the fact that things don't have definite values, they're fluctuations. The fluctuations in what is measurable in these large n theories become smaller and smaller and smaller as n becomes very large. This means that these theories become classical in a new and interesting way. You know, in developing the quantization of quantum electrodynamics, one trick was used. The trick was that when you take a certain coupling constant, h bar, and take it to zero, a quantum theory becomes classical. There is another way in which quantum theories can become classical. When n becomes very large, a sort of thermodynamic limit. Okay, so this had been known for a long time. But if you asked, any physicist before Maldesena, I think, if you ask what you expect, you know, so you take, let's say, this, 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 this theory of uh, a large n matrices, when n becomes very large, the theory becomes classical, but what are the classical equations that govern this theory? I think most people would have thought, would have guessed, it'll be some god-awful, non-local, unmanageable mess. What Maldesena discovered was that this theory, when you took the n goes to infinity limit, 
became classical. That was not the surprise. The surprise was that the classical equations that governed the theory in the large n limit were not some god awful mess, but were the most beautiful equations ever written down by human beings, namely Einstein's equations of general relativity. But Einstein's equations of general relativity not in four dimensions, but in this 10 dimensional space. This remarkable fact that this large n limit produces a classical theory that we knew, but not just any classical theory, classical Einstein gravity is uh, Valdesena's discovery. Now, okay, so you see, we managed to get a, ten, a, gra a classical gravitational theory from a fully quantum starting point, namely z equals 4 n equals 4 super Young's theory. It became classical not when the coupling constant of this theory went to zero, but when n went to infinity. As n retreats from infinity, this theory starts moving away from being classical. Uh, so 1 over n is the parameter that governs quantum fluctuations of space-time in this area. Okay, but now notice that space and time itself, this classical large n limit itself, arose in the large n limit. It was a device that you invent to simplify the theory, to, to solve the theory at large n. When you take n away from infinity, say n's, n's a million, you see small fluctuations in this classical physics. When you take n equals 2, there is no sense in which space-time is there at all. Okay, and so within this model we see that 10-dimensional space-time is an approximation that emerges in the large n limit. 1 over n corrections lead to quantum fluctuations of the 10-dimensional geometry. However, once these fluctuations are all summed up, and any finite value of n, certainly small values of n, we are left with a 4-dimensional field theory. This 10-dimensional space-time has evaporated away. If you like to be poetical, you could say 10 dimensional space time in the true mathematics of this theory was an illusion, it was never there. Okay, 10 dimensional space time and gravity have disappeared. They play no role in the fundamental formulation of the theory. They just emerge at large n and very approximate notions at any finite value of n becoming more and more approximate as n becomes small. Sounds really interesting, doesn't it? Okay, within this model, therefore, there is a sense in which space time is an illusion. An emergent notion that has precise meaning, only a very large n, but whose reality becomes increasingly tenuous as n is, de is decreased. Now, um, uh, when I was preparing for this talk, I, uh, uh, I went and looked, I viewed one or, two, one or two of the earlier talks in the series, and I, uh, I saw the talk by Joseph Pulchinsky from nine, uh, from nine or ten years ago. Uh, it's a wonderful talk by a wonderful person whom I certainly miss very much. But the reason I brought this up was that in his talk, um, one of the central points of his talk was the question of the black hole information paradox. Okay, and I wanted to make connection with that, uh, with what has been learned since his talk about about that issue. Okay, um, in our review of the structure of uh, quantum field theories, um, I tried to emphasize the local structure of the uh, of these theories. The fact that you have degrees of freedom one tight to each point in space. Um, okay, now um, let me say a little bit more about that. In a quantum field theory, if I have an object here, that object in its fundamental formulation is represented as oscillations of the fields that are in that region of space where that object is. That in the fundamental mathematical formulation is what that object is a collection of oscillations of fields in the region of the space where that, where that object is. Okay, an object there is oscillations of fields here. Okay, this local nature of, of, of quantum field theories is sort of essential to our understanding of them and essential to them making sense in many ways. For instance, um, it forbids action at a distance. It forbids me from doing something here and having somebody know about, know, know that I did this here or having something affected um, 10 light years away. Okay? That is forbidden. It's a good thing that that's forbidden. Because if that was not forbidden, then we could, then causality would probably be out of the window. You know, as you probably know, two events that are simultaneous in one reference frame, according to Einstein's special theory of relativity, need, are not in general simultaneous in other reference frames. And if two events happen at the same time, but are very far separated, 
there's another frame of reference in which one of them happens earlier than the other. Another frame of reference which, in which this guy happens earlier than the other. So if I could affect something instantaneously by doing something here, I could affect something instantaneously there. I could make a sort of go back in time kind of machine, uh, which seems to be disastrous for logic or for physics. Okay, the fact that in quantum field theories, this locality of degrees of freedom pre prevents action at a distance, protects causality, some, somehow seems very important in the structure of the theory. Okay, what I wanted to tell you about was that this basic feature of how things work appears, we've learned over, you know, sort of emphatically over the last three or four years, that this basic feature of how things works in quantum field theories appears to be different in, in theories with dynamical, you know, in theories with dynamical space times, in particular in theories with emergent space times. Okay. Um, what we appear to have learned, and it's all very new and settling in, and I hope I'm not mistaking, but what we appear to have learned is this, that in theories with dynamical space times, sometimes it can happen that this glass of water here is at the fundamental not oscillations of stuff that is located here, but could be oscillations of stuff that's very, very far away. That happens when, uh, that can happen when the degrees of freedom located here are highly quantum entangled with the degrees of freedom located there. The general rule appears to be that an object located here is either oscillations in the fields around here or oscillations in stuff that is not necessarily nearby, but is highly entangled with stuff that is here. Okay. This strange lesson that we appear to have learnt over the last three or four years uh, uh, impacts, um, impacts the study of the black hole information paradox. Uh, as some of you know, and as Pulchinsky so beautifully reviewed in his talk, um, many physicists have argued that black holes and quantum mechanics are inconsistent with each other. Uh, these physicists include Hawking, of course, famously, Mathur, uh, Almeri, Marol, Pulchinsky, Sully, many, many people in between. Okay. And these, these physicists argued that the strange nature of black holes makes it sort of impossible for both all the things that we expect for space-time, the smooth space-time era, horizon of a black hole, and the things we expect from quantum mechanics to be consistent with each other. So some people, for instance, Hawking used that to argue that quantum mechanics must fail in the presence of black holes. Other people, AMPs, the KITP people argued that space-time must break down to the presence of black holes. There should be a firewall at the, at the horizon. What this new understanding has given us a third way out. All of these arguments which tried to uh, talk about the inconsistency of black, hole with black holes with quantum mechanics were making some reasonable assumptions about how degrees of freedom are encoded, that this encoding was more or less local. We sort of understand that this is not always the case. And because it's not always the case, it's possible for both black holes to be smooth and quantum mechanics to be unitary without any clear contradiction because of the strange sort of non-local encoding of degrees of freedom. Okay, so it seems most likely now, unlike what Pulchinsky said 10 years ago, it seems most likely now that quantum mechanics is correct, black holes are smooth at the horizon, okay, but that the way out of these paradoxes has to do with this strange non-locality of encoding of degrees of freedom. This is a lesson we've more or less learned through the study of uh, these gauge gravity dualities, the, this, the spherical cow theory of gravity. Uh, but as I will tell you in a minute, we believe that this lesson extends beyond these spherical cow theories. Okay. Um, good. So, so far we've occupied ourselves with very deep things. Nature of space-time, space-time and illusion, uh, is locality, true. These are fantastic things. Over the next five or ten minutes, we will become more lowbrow. You see, uh, one of the things I told you was that we've got a model for quantum gravity by that the, un, the, 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 the complete description of this quantum theory of gravity is a quantum field theory. Okay? And the way I've run the talk so far, 
I've used that as a way to try to understand quantum gravity. Quantum field theories are well understood things in principle. We use them to develop this quantum theory of gravity, this fully satisfactory spherical cow quantum theory of gravity. However, there is another way of viewing it. While quantum field theories are in principle very completely well understood, in practice, one cannot usually solve, understand, compute what one wants to in a complicated quantum field theory. In fact, a lot, you know, a large, large communities of physicists spend their time trying to understand how particular quantum field theories work. Okay? So, where such a duality, such a, a, such, such a duality between gravity and quantum field theories are true, we can turn the logic around. We can try to use gravity to learn about the quantum field theories. And I'm going to give you one example of how, of, of, of a way in which that was done and what we learned from it. Okay. Um, so here I've tried to explain the, uh, the, the, the basic idea. We can try to turn the logic around to use gravity to learn about strongly coupled quantum field theory dynamics. Because classical gravity in the end is an easy thing. It's just classical equations of motion. Okay. So the thing that I'm going to tell you about is hydrodynamics. You see, on intuitive grounds, um, people have long expected that in appropriate conditions, high enough energy densities, long wavelengths, every quantum field theory admits an effective classical description in terms of the equations of hydrodynamics. The equations of hydrodynamics are the, the equations that describe the flow of air in the atmosphere, the flow of water, if you include the surfaces, and you know, uh, the, the flow of fluids. Okay, the main idea here is that stuff equilibrates, you know, comes to equilibrium locally very fast. And then this, the passage from stuff equilibrating here and here and here and here, but with one temperature here, another temperature here, with one velocity here, another velocity here, the passage from going from that locally equilibrated state to a globally equilibrated state is described by the equations of hydrodynamics. Okay, so the expectation is that under appropriate situations, Everything is described by the equations of hydrodynamics. Now, the equations of hydrodynamics were formulated, I mean, to start with almost 200 years ago, but in their modern form, almost 100 years ago. And the formulation of these equations was widely believed to be a settled subject. Now, if all locally equilibrated quantum field theories are governed by the classical equations of hydrodynamics, then this must also be true of this theory with the big name, n equals 4, d equals 4, super young series. Supersymmetric Yangman's theory. Okay. So, general intuition tells us that there are certain limits, long wavelengths compared to energy densities, in which this theory should be governed by the equations of hydrodynamics, which is a classical equation. But at large n, we've already seen that this Yangman's theory has another effective classical description. The equations of gravity in ADS 5 times S5. Okay. It seems unlikely that one theory can have two different classical descriptions. So if everything I'm saying is correct, it seems like it must be the case. Okay, and one more thing. I told you that, uh, that uh, uh, hydrodynamics was the dynamics of locally equilibrated stuff. Now you can ask, what is the gravity dual of something in equilibrium, in thermal equilibrium? This is something that was discovered very, very soon after the discovery of Maldacena's discovery of the ADS safety correspondence. The idea was that stuff in thermal equilibrium is a big black hole in the gravity stuff, in the gravity description. Okay, hydrodynamics is the description of stuff that is locally equilibrated, but sort of sloshing around. So, if everything I've said um, is hanging together, it sort of must be that there is an effective description of big black holes in this ADS5 trans S5 space, sloshing around. And that effective description should be given by the equations of four-dimensional hydrodynamics. Okay. Uh, okay. So a few years ago, my collaborators and I, uh, okay, I forgot the and I, set out to check whether this was indeed the case. It turned out we could do the analysis. We were able to describe the equations that govern the sloshing around of these big black holes. And as hoped, these equations were those of four-dimensional four hydrodynamics. But there was a twist. 
The twist was that the hydrodynamical equations that we found contained two terms that did not appear in classic textbooks on hydrodynamics. These textbooks claimed to have classified all possible terms in the equations of hydrodynamics. We didn't find our terms um, in these textbooks. Actually, we didn't even know about these textbooks. Somebody wrote to us later on saying, yeah, very interesting paper, but can't be right because, you know, <laughs> okay. Uh, but, okay, fine. So there was a, some back and forth. And when things settled down, turned out the classic textbooks were wrong. They missed some terms. Okay? They missed some terms. Not only were there some terms in the, the in the equations of hydrodynamics that could be there, there are some situations in which they had to be there. Uh, for quantum field theories with global symmetry anomalies, for those of you who are interested. And so once you that story was worked out for the for the theory we were studying, n equals four Yang Mills. Um, the, the terms that we found from gravity analysis not only could have been there, but it was later understood had to have been there. Okay? So this is a second example of the use of these ideas in a very different way. You see, we've been talking about deep stuff. But, you know, there's sometimes a duality between the deep and the precise. Okay? Here, in this case, by turning this around, what we were able to, because, you know, string theory gets these equations so correct. We were able to derive these equations of hydrodynamics in full detail, find that they didn't agree with general expectations that were based on what else can it be, and then you fix those general expectations. Okay? Once you fixed them, you've corrected the general expectation arguments, so this fixed equations apply not just to your spherical cow theory, which who cares about in the end, but to every theory that's described by hydrodynamics. The structure of these equations is now understood correctly. In the same way, this business about the non-locality of description, okay, while it was originally discovered by looking at uh, these, the spherical cow emergent theory of gravity, the understanding of it now comes from semi-classical Einstein gravity, which means that we believe that it must be true in any theory that is described approximately by Einstein's equations. So you see the utility of studying the spherical cow. Okay? You learn, you discover something when you study it that you didn't know, but that was a discovery in the context of a particular example. But then you realize that it challenges something you thought was impossible. You go back and study that, and then you learn something by, by resolving this contradiction. You learn something that applies not just to your spherical cow, to your particular example, but to every theory of the kind you're studying. Okay? So this is one reason to be in, interested in such toy model studies. That's, of course, the point of them, to learn general lessons, not just for the model you're studying. Okay, I'm almost done. Several aspects of the story I've outlined about remain unsatisfactorily understood. To start with, the fact that this mouthful theory reduces to 10-dimensional 2B supergravity at large n has been established by, you know, has been sort of conjectured by Maldasena using arguments within the string theory framework. We, direct, we lack a direct field theoretic understanding of this fact. In other words, we do not understand in detail precisely how space-time and fluctuating metrics emerge out of strongly coupled gauge dynamics. We certainly do not understand this funny non-locality of emergent space-times in any detail. How is it consistent with causality, for instance? So on. None of that in any detail. There's lots that remains to be done. As I've described, the formulation of a single quantum non- single complete non-trivial quantum theory of gravity has been a highly non-trivial accomplishment that has yielded so many surprising insights and keeps, keeps yielding more. Every few years there's something new. Now, you could have asked me, somebody could have asked me in the middle of the talk, why did you start with this strange theory on quantum theory of gravity, which was when nothing is happening is ADS 5 times S5, aren't there? Other theories, what about just flat space? And certainly within the string, String in the manifold of string vacua, you have these wonderful 10 dimensional flat space string theories. Okay? Natural question what is the complete formulation of quantum gravity of these 10 dimensional flat space theories? We don't know. Okay? There are several such theories out there, we don't know. The complete formulation of one such spherical cow model has taught us so much. There are zillions of these spherical cows lying there. We should study them all. Okay? Now, I started this talk by telling you about the birth of the universe. 
We want, we, I said we want to know about quantum gravity partly because we want to understand how the universe began. This unfortunately is not a spherical cow question. It's a question about gravity in our universe. The one we live in. Okay. So the natural next question is, does the quantum theory of gravity in the real world lie within the string framework? Is it one of these spherical cows out there that happens to be the right one? Or if so, which one? How do we identify it? How do we understand, you know, check which one is the right theory? I don't know. I don't know the answer to these questions, but I think it's likely somehow that some input from experiment, perhaps in an unanticipated manner, will play a role in answering this. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, so one, one slide summary. Quantum gravity, uh, we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, and we need one, if for no other reason, likely to understand the birth of the universe. The one phenomenon that all of us, are, I would imagine, are interested in. Okay. String theory is an exciting but incompletely understood framework for quantum theories of gravity, has led to the complete but surprising formulation of a class of 10-dimensional quantum gra uh, gravity systems. The formulation was in terms of quantum field theories in lower dimensions. Okay? Remember the contradiction between how could it be that a quantum field theory is so different from quantum gravity and yet the quantum field theory is the underlying theory of quantum gravity comes about because there is an effective emergent description in a parameter, large n, okay, in which that effective emergent description magically becomes gravity. It's amazing. We don't understand it in the detail we should. Okay. Um, the result, as I mentioned, is a great surprise. Space and time are emergent notions of this model. There's a sense in which space time is an illusion. It's, it's precise only at large n, becomes less and less precise as we move away from large n. Um, large entanglement in space time can result in a strange non locality. Okay. The complete formulation of other gravitational systems is an outstanding formal challenge. Uh, there's much more, presumably, waiting to be learned. And of course, the formulation of the non spherical cow theory of quantum gravity, the theory of quantum gravity in the universe in which we live, the thing we really want to know the answer to, that's another huge, huge challenge. Okay. Thank you. Okay, while well, Shiraz takes his first breath, <laughs> in the last 55 minutes, questions, yeah, please. I didn't hear what you said. I did have a question, actually, um, but I couldn't hear. Um, these corrections to classical hydrodynamics, when were they discovered? When were they discovered? 2008. Thank you. Yes. Are those the Navier Stokes? Well, they were, they're corrections to the relativistic versions of the Navier Stokes equations. Yes. Nobody's ever solved that. Yes, but you know, there are two issues. First, getting the right equations. Next, solving them. Okay? <laughs> the equations themselves in some situations were wrong. Jerg. Yes, does entangled mean uh, entanglement infer instantaneous time? Sorry, can entanglement uh, result in communication yeah. uh, at a distance? Not in quantum field theory. So entanglement, you cannot use entanglement to, to send information from here to there instantaneously. Okay? So, so, so that's a great question. You see, there are two things that sometimes get confused with each other. One is what already happens in a quantum field theory. Thus things can be entangled with each other, and then that can be very useful to in doing various things. For instance, you can do quantum teleportation if you also send a classical message. But you need the classical information to flow. Okay? So it cannot do this sending information instantaneously. Okay? It's not that it's when, so when something there is entangled with something here, it's not that the stuff that's sitting here is oscillations of that thing in a quantum field theory. It's oscillations of this stuff, just that the stuff that's oscillating here is entangled with the other stuff. What's different in this gravitational setup or appears to be, is that it's not just entanglement is happening, but the stuff that is, that, the, the, this, 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 this pointer here is actually encoded not in oscillations of stuff here that is entangled with stuff there, but can be in, encoded in oscillations of stuff there, if it happens to be entangled with other things near here. So it's different and subtly different and it's very confusing. For the microphone. 
Hi, thank you. That was a really awesome talk. I don't know how well I followed all of it, but it was very inspiring. And I had a question about the motivation for even pursuing a quantum uh, version of gravity is, you kind of stated, was mostly just turning the clock back in time to understand sort of Big Bang and beyond where our classical limits are there. That's one motivation, yes. And, and yeah, I was wondering about your, just your opinion on um, just pursuing this consistency between these two really disparate ways of looking at the universe, sort of the quantum way and sort of this macroscopic way. Absolutely. So what, what um, so clearly, I mean, like most things in physics and astronomy, it's like you discover things that you never thought you were going to discover when you pursue things that have never been pursued. Yes. And I'm wondering, in this pursuit to make these things consistent, yes. um, what do you think the probability is that we will discover like these really weird things like dark energy or, or like some hints at like what these you know, macroscopic phenomena that we have no idea what it is, w whether that, those answers really lie in this, in this pursuit of quantum gravity? Excellent. OK. Uh, I think the chance that we will discover many, many things that we had never conceived of, like this kind of strain in non-locality, is 100%. Okay. Um, whether we will discover something that we have phenomenologically seen, like dark energy or dark matter, that would be the best case. But that requires us to be studying, that may require us to be studying you know, it's a question about whether it's some generic thing that happens in a large class of quantum gravity theories or something specific to the theory that we happen to be living. At the moment, our investigations, as I've tried to emphasize, are only in these toy models, which are easy to study. And it could be that, let's say, the dark matter is some particular particle that happens to be present in our universe that has no counterpart in ADS 5 plus S5, then we won't discover it. You see, so for that question, I'm uh, agnostic. It's possible, especially for dark energy, that there's something structured on there. But it's also possible that it's, it has to do with detail. And then these kind of investigations will not. But of course, if you identify the real theory, it should. I'm sorry for the ambiguous answer. <laughs> yes, I, I really appreciate your, your theoretical development into hydrodynamic uh, models. I, I used to be a fluid dynamicist. Ah. <laughs> so one very important lesson that you learn doing fluids is to simplify equations for different re regimes of space-time, basically. I mean, we throw away the viscous term and we I assume that it's that. non-viscous and all these sort of assumptions you make. And I've often thought that we don't know what equations apply if you go back to the beginning of the universe. You simply don't know what that's going to, and, and you're making some progress there, so I congratulate you. The second thing that I take from your talk here is that we always talk about the atoms in a gas, for example, as having this random motion, but yet in fluid dynamics, we ignore that. We take the statistical result, we say the yes. fluid acts like this. Yes. It seems like you're doing the same sort of it's an thing here. Yeah, and, and also turbulence. Turbulence has so many analogies and, and lessons to be learned. You, we can't describe turbulence in detail. We look at the gross result, the statistical result of, of the turbulence. So I, I'm very glad to to hear your talk and learn about this. Thank you. Let me pick up on just the second point you made for, for, for a minute, because that's really excellent. I mean, it's really key to some of this. You see, um, as, as, he, as I think one of the lessons that we are learning, okay, so n equals four angles. Suppose we take n equals four angles at finite temperature. Okay, that's when you've got the stuff described by a fluid. Now you can ask, what is it a fluid of? Well, it's a fluid of the gluons of n equals 4 angles. We know that very clearly. So the atoms in that case are replaced by the n equals 4 angles gluons. This is from the side of the field theory. On the gravity, though, we don't see the gluons in our face. We only see these fluid dynamical variables. So this already is suggesting something. It's telling us about the nature of the equations of gravity. They sort of like the equations, at least in some analogous way, of fluid dynamics of some more fundamental underlying degrees of freedom. In the case of n equals 4 angles, we could identify what those degrees of freedom were. They were the gluons. In general situations, there will be something else. So I think that the point you made is very important and has important lessons for quantum gravity and not completely gone into our heads yet. 
So, thanks for a great talk. Thank um, you. Maybe slightly, uh, this one is going to be slightly technical, but um, if indeed the coarse graining of these theories is hydrodynamic. In the field theory side? Yeah, so yes. why, is, why is it, how do you explain the fact that, for example, the fog dirac equation doesn't have any notion of velocity in it? The, which equation? Please? The fog dirac so just the, 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 dirac the relativistic extension of the Dirac equation, yeah. The Dirac equation does not have any notion of velocity in it. Yeah, okay. so let's, let's yeah. take the standard Dirac in yeah. flat space. Yeah. It okay. doesn't have any notion of velocity. Of course it? not. So the Dirac equation describes, let's say, one electron. Now you put a bunch of electrons in it. You put other numbers of electrons in it. Okay? And the velocity that enters hydrodynamics is not the velocity of any one of these electrons. It's the velocity of that mass. So the idea is that in hydrodynamics you've got these electrons that are banging into each other. And they very quickly locally thermally, thermally equilibrate. The velocity distribution becomes, uh, you know, Maxwellian or the Dirac version of Maxwellian. But it becomes Maxwellian with one temperature here and another temperature here. The frame in which it's become Maxwellian here is moving like this. Well, the frame in which it's become Maxwellian here is moving like this. Those relative speeds of those frames are the velocities of fluid dynamics. So you see, this velocity is an emergent notion. It's not velocity of the electrons. It's velocity, it's velocity of this equilibrated stuff. Is this clear? Just like temperature is an emergent notion. There's no sense in which an electron has a temperature. It's, it's temperature of this stuff. So this happens all the time in physics, and fluid dynamics is like that. Is this clear? All right, on that note, Shraz, I want to thank you for the remarkable lecture, and thank all of you for coming this evening. <laughs>